All right. Well, good morning, Eastern Hills. My name's Rob, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here on staff. If you're at home online, glad to have you with us as well. Uh, imagine with me if you can, uh, you know, you decide to head out to the Chick-fil-A um, to have a, a meal with someone that you care about, and, and you guys are both biting into those delicious Chick-fil-A sandwiches, and they both have, you know, you put the sauce on it because it takes that much better. But imagine with me if you can, you take a big bite of that Chick-fil-A sandwich, and you get a little bit of sauce on your face. Now, if that person sitting across the table from you is sitting there in this tense filled moment, do they tell you that you've got sauce on your face or not? Let me ask you this morning, Easter Hills, if, are you the type of person when you go out to lunch with someone and they got a little bit of sauce on their face, do you tell them that they got something on their face? Raise your hand this morning. I don't know how honest we're being. Because studies would say that most of the time people don't. And do you know why? And do you know who is to blame? Parents. Parents are to blame. Because from a very uh, early stage as children, we hear our parents say this. If you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. But what's funny is that as parents, we don't even follow that premise ourselves because we say unnice things all the time, but we say it in the name of love. We say because we want what's best for you, because we love for you, we have love for you because we want you to thrive, we're gonna say some things that are gonna be hard for you to hear. And this premise of not saying anything nice at all doesn't even translate into the workplace, right? Because if you're in management and if you're in leadership, sometimes you have to sit down and have some hard and honest conversations, and you're doing it because you want what's best for them, you want what's best for the team, or you want what's best for your business or organization or practice. Well, for the next seven weeks, we're going to look at seven letters from Jesus to seven churches, real churches, that we read about in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And some of the things that Jesus is going to say are going to be difficult for us to receive. And the temptation for us on Sundays over the next seven weeks is to walk away saying, ouch, that hurts. But what we have to understand is that Jesus is not our supervisor. In fact, when Jesus describes his relationship with the church, he says that we are his bride. And that Jesus desires intimacy with us. Intimacy being this process of being fully known, fully understood, and fully accepted. Well, you don't get there without some hard conversations along the way. And so my invitation for all of us over the next seven weeks is that we wouldn't walk away saying, ouch, that hurts. We'd walk away saying, ouch, that helps. And we're gonna practice this morning, okay? In a moment, I'm gonna invite you to say, ouch, but I want you to say it with some conviction. I want you to say it like you're Marv from the movie Home Alone, like there's some pain involved. Saturday morning, yesterday, we wake up, our youngest daughter, she's got the flu, and so we do what most parents do. We sit her on the couch in front of the television, and we say, what do you want to watch? And out of all the things that she said she wanted to watch, she chose the movie Elf. She's the daughter after my own heart. She loves those Christmas movies. She's counting down the moments. One of my favorites is Home Alone. There's a lot of pain and laughter in that movie. So I want you to say this this morning. I want you to say it with some conviction. I want you to say, ouch, that helps. One, two, three, ouch. That helps. Good. We're ready. Grab your Bible if you have it or if you have it on your phone. You're going to turn to the last book. We're going to be in Revelation. And as you're doing that, I'm going to pray for our time. God, we believe that your word is written in love. We believe that you're a God that loves us so much that you didn't want us to be abandoned and, and led astray, that you've given us this instruction to guide us and steer us, God. Remind us of the hope that we have in you this morning. Would you encourage us? Would you exhort us, Lord? Would you also help us to see those areas of our lives that we're falling short, God? Because we need you. So as the Spirit moves this morning through your word, God, would you be glorified? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so if you think about the book of Revelation, what comes to mind? Probably some, like, interesting imagery, right? Some like apocalyptic movies, like the end of the world is here. 
And if you're new to faith, if you're new to Christianity, or uh, you're just trying to figure out how to follow Jesus, don't start in Revelation. You know, these people are crazy. Like, what is it these Christians believe? Start in the Gospel of John. Great place to start. John, same John that gives us Revelation. Gospel of John, that's a great place. Fall in love with Jesus first, and then make your way through the Bible. But to better understand some of the craziness that we experience in Scripture, we got to understand that there's different genres of Scripture. So we understand that there's this narrative portion of Scripture, things like Exodus and Ruth, that tell a story. And sometimes those are historical stories. Sometimes it's just people unfolding their story for other people to read about and to learn from. And there's there's poetry, like we read about poetry in the book of Psalms. We have wisdom and, and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and there's prophecy. You have four major prophets, 12 minor prophets, all basically saying the same things. Repent, turn to God, trust in him. The Gospels. We get the life story of Jesus, not just you know, uh, stories that people have made up, but eyewitness testimony, people that witness these facts unfolding and this challenge to follow after him. The epistles, so important for us to understand, but we have to understand the epistles in context because these were written to specific people during a specific period of time for a specific purpose. So for us to understand epistles, we have to unpack them in the context of the church that they were written to. Much like apocalyptic literature that we read about, like in the last book, Revelation. You have some prophecy, but you have some creative imagery as well, all to help us better understand and to follow Jesus. And so if we read the first chapter, first chapter paves the way for the rest of the book that we read. So we're going to start in verse 9 this morning. I'm going to read verses through 20, because over the next several weeks, we're going to be parked in chapters 2 and 3. But if we read verses 9 through 20, it helps us better understand what happens in 2 and 3. So it says, Revelation 1, chapter 9, I, John, this is the author, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So how did he end up there? Well, he said, I'm going to follow Jesus, which led to a life of persecution. And his punishment was to be stranded on this island and left for death. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now, some of us have the type of children that will literally walk up behind us and scare us. To death. Some of you have those type of kids at home. Well, John has this type of moment. I can't even imagine what it would be like, but he says, Jesus to John, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Ephesus Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see this voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, which is the title that we read about in the gospel. It's pointing to Jesus, his kingship, his authority. He's in charge. He's making a point here. He's dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. And with a golden sash around his chest, the hair on his head was like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. We'll read about that in the weeks to come as well. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And so after John experiences all of this, it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, this is not like John had some things to eat the night before and had some crazy dreams, and this is just like his imagination. No, this is Jesus shows up to John and pulls back reality. And he says, I'm going to let you see reality for what it is. And so for us, if we were to experience that, we might have a similar response. Like, am I dead? But Jesus says to John, and then he placed his right hand on me and says, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. Like, let's just talk about who I am here. This is my resume. I am the living one. I was once dead, but now I'm risen. I'm alive. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. 
And I hold the keys of death and Hades. All life comes into existence because of Jesus. It's sustained for Jesus. It's for Jesus' purposes. He decides our first day, and he decides our last day. He says, Jesus tells John, write therefore what you have seen, what I have revealed to you, what is both now, but also what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, I, I grew up playing the original video game system after Atari, of course, a Nintendo. And one of the things that I loved about the game Nintendo is when the Game Genie came out because Game Genie gave you all of these codes to help you be invincible. You could crush any level, defeat any game, because they were cheat codes. That's what they were. They were cheat codes. And so as we go through the book of Revelation, we're going to find some cheat codes that are going to help us better understand what's happening as we read through this book. And so Jesus gives us two. So the lampstand, pretty obvious, each of the lampstands reference to the seven churches that he's referring to. But this first one's a little bit more complicated because as we read different scholars, there's different interpretations of terms of the reference to the angel of the church. The word angel, this, this idea of a messenger, some people say this was the, the pastor or the leader of the church, and some people say it was this heavenly angelic being that was a part of the church. The good news is, is that this is one of those moments in Scripture where it's okay to say, I'm not sure. I don't know. And the reason for that is because however it is that you interpret it doesn't impact the rest of this message. Because Jesus is helping us understand this message to these seven churches. And as we better understand his message to these other churches, we'll also better understand his message to our church. And so here we have this map. And this was a real uh, mail route that existed during the time of John's letter. So you would start in Ephesus and make your way up to Smyrna and Pergamos, and then you would make your all the way down to Laodicea, and it was a route. And this Ephesus major city during this time, you had this ocean port, um, heavy, heavy population, a lot of major things happened in Ephesus. But the key here, again, these are not places or imaginary places, these are real places, real problems happen in a real time. And what we learn about Ephesus is that it had a very interesting start. And this is what makes the Bible great, is it's historical. You can read about things that happened at one point in time. And so in Acts chapter 19, we read about the start of Ephesus. And it's an interesting start, interesting way to launch a church. So people show up with the gospel People start coming to know Jesus, and one of those groups were sorcerers. And one of their responses to the gospel is to say, I'm going to turn from my wicked ways, I'm going to repent, and I'm all in on Jesus. But part of that process was to burn their scrolls. And the value of the scrolls that they burned that day was 136 years of wages and salary. That's quite a statement saying I'm all in. We read about Ephesus. It's got its own book in the New Testament. We read about some of the instructions to pastors and leaders in First and Second Timothy. But when we get to Revelation chapter 2, this is a message to the church of Ephesus, but the next generation. This is a message to those that are picking up the mantle and that are going to continue the ministry of the church. And some of you have gone through a process of passing on things to the next generation, not just in parenting, but also in business. Do you know 70% of businesses that are trying to pass on leadership to the next generation fail? You know, churches that have long tenured pastors, like 25, 30 years, when they attempt to pass on leadership to the next generation, most of them fail. You know, NFL franchises that have like 20 years of dominance in the NFL really struggle to pass on leadership like a certain team that I watch, the New England Patriots, that just stink right now. It's hard to pass on leadership. And Jesus knew this as he penned these words. His love for the church of Ephesus, his desire is not to hurt, but rather help. He says... To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? These are the words of him 
who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. If you're familiar with the Great Commission, you understand the promise. Not only did Jesus say to go forth and make disciples, he also reminded us what? That he's with us always. And here we have this reminder that Jesus walks among these churches. It's not a reminder that he's like he's off doing his own thing. No, he's, he's very much with them. And this still holds true for us today. So if you're a follower of Jesus, whatever it is that you're walking through right now, Jesus walks with you. And it also means that our church, as we walk through different difficult things, it's a reminder that he walks with us as well. This is meant to be an encouragement that Jesus is present. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. So this is a church that's smart. They know their theology. They know their doctrine. This is a church that would say that holiness matters. This is a church that can spot posers from a mile away. Say, you preach this, but you live differently. This is maybe even a church where they had like, like former sorcerers on the elder board. So they know something about deception. And Jesus says, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So they're battle tested. They're not afraid. They've gone through some hard things. And at this point, if this was a description of a church and you showed up church shopping, like they're smart, they know theology, they oppose error and doctrine, they're battle tested, they've gone through some things, you would say, this is my church. We're done shopping. This is going to be home. And yet what Jesus says next might catch us off guard. He says, and yet after all of that, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Then he says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. See, there's some caution here. Any church is susceptible to worshiping theology over the giver of theology. Any church is susceptible to pride and saying, look at all of the great things that we've done for Jesus and then doing the comparison game with other churches. Well, look what we're doing. Look what we've been a part of. Look what we've accomplished. Any church is susceptible to building walls instead of bridges. Looking for opportunities to be unified in the purpose of God's mission. See, the problem with the church of Ephesus wasn't their lack of courage or willingness to step into injustices. The problem wasn't their, their courage to oppose false teaching. The problem with the church of Ephesus is that people had become the enemy. People had become the enemy. That all of the energy and all of the attention was saying that this person or this group, they are the enemy. And so we read about in Ephesus that the reminder is we know who the enemy is. It's not against flesh and blood. And so here Jesus isn't messing around. Some pretty harsh words here. He says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. <laughs> if, if you're a pastor or an elder and you get this text message from Jesus, ouch! Like, hey, if you guys don't get your act together, I'm gonna close the doors of the church. Jesus is saying, it would be better for me to close your church than to keep it open. And some would say, well, isn't it better to at least share the truth and proclaim the gospel, even if it's apart from love? I mean, at least the word's getting out. Jesus would say no. 
I have to proclaim the gospel and truth and teach the word, but it has to be done with love. Love for people. And the moment we stop doing that, and the moment that people become our enemy, Jesus says, you've lost your way. You have forsaken your first love. So Jesus explains further what exactly is happening here in this church. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. But notice here that he's not commending them for their hate of people. He's commending them for hating their practices. It's like there are people with a story and a purpose and a plan that God created them. He desires to know them. Yes, they're making choices that are apart from Jesus, and we condemn the practices, but we love the people. We condemn the practices, but we love the people. We, we don't know much historically about this group other than that they were on the wrong side of Jesus. He continues, he says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you want to learn more about this paradise that awaits us, fast forward to the end of Revelation, read chapters 21 and 22, and get excited for what awaits you in eternity if you're united in Christ and Him. But for the purpose of this study, over and over again, what we're going to hear is this, these words, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this is how we know that Jesus is communicating not out of a posture of, ouch, that hurts, but out of a posture that says, here, I'm here to help. There's still opportunities to turn things around, to repent, and to turn to him. See, Jesus' message to the church of Ephesus is simple to understand, but it's hard to practice. It could be summarized in this way. Choose discernment over judgment. At first glance, discernment and judgment seem to be in the same camp, but they're not. Discernment says, this is wrong. This is something that's an error. This is an injustice. This is evil. This is sin. That's not okay. But what makes it discernment is that the lens is love. You remember the conversation with Jesus? Hey, there's a lot of things that, you know, our Heavenly Father communicated to Moses. I mean, can you simplify things for us? And Jesus' response, we need to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we need to love our neighbors like what? Ourselves. Both instructions, the common denominator, love, love, love. That's the framework for discernment. So when we're evaluating practices or behavior or choices or things that we would classify as evil or an injustice, here's the framework. Does this violate your love for Jesus? Does this violate your love for others? And also, does this violate Jesus' love for you, for me? Let me give you an example of what this looks like in practice. Imagine with me, if you can, you go out with some friends. Uh, it's a Friday or Saturday night, and you have some drinks. But the person that drove you there had a few too many, and now he's intoxicated or she's intoxicated. And they're supposed to drive people home. Are you going to let that person get in the car and drive people home? No, absolutely not. And I would say, in fact, the majority of people in this room would take it a step further and make sure that that person doesn't get behind the wheel and drive anybody home, including themselves. And why would you do that? In the name of love. Because you care for them as an individual. And you care for everybody else that would be on the road that evening that might be impacted by that person's decision to get behind the wheel and drive because that's the loving thing to do. It's not the time to have the conversation of, listen, buddy, or listen, gal, you made some horrible choices here, and you need to fend for yourself. Good luck and find your own way home. No one's having that conversation. It's a matter of how do we care for all those who are involved 
right now in this moment. We're going to choose discernment because sometimes discernment leads us to say, I can't join you in that. Because of my love for Jesus, because of my love for you as a person, because of his love for me, I'm not going to stand with you in that. And do you know that that's the gospel? Jesus looks at our life and he sees our sin and says, I can't stand with you in that. But I'm not going to leave you in that. I'm going to come and live the life that you could never live and die the death that you deserve to die. And I'm going to take all of the punishment, all of the wrath that humanity rightfully deserves, and I'm going to carry that burden for you because you can't do that. And it's joy that's set before me for every person that would turn from their sin and the error of their ways and place all of their allegiance to Jesus, that they would be new creations so that Jesus could once again stand with them apart from sin. And he does it all in the name of love. For God so what? Loved. That's our Savior. So here's the important question. What's the difference between judgment and discernment? Not judgment between God and his people, because that looks a little bit different, but judgment amongst one another in our day to day. Judgment sounds like I'm above you. Sometimes it sounds like I'm afraid of you. So I'm going to act like I have greater importance than you. Sometimes it's just, my life and my actions say, I don't love you. Discerning churches have a posture of humility. Discerning churches have a posture of love. Judgmental churches have a posture of superiority, fear, and they lack love. At first glance, judgment and discernment seem similar, but when you look at the outcome of judgment, and when you look at the outcome of discernment, they're miles apart. Jesus was trying to help the church of Ephesus understand that discernment pushes us closer and judgment pulls us apart. Because discernment is driven by love. Whenever love is the motivation, it has this funny way of bringing people together. But when we lack love, this thing happens. We're driven apart. And so as followers of Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, I say let's let Jesus judge because he's a just judge. He's the only one to qual qualify to sit in the seat of judgment because he's merciful, he's gracious, he knew no sin. So let's let him judge and let us be the type of church that embraces discernment. And we're gonna practice that this morning. And I'd like us to think about some things that our church might be vulnerable to. Some things that maybe could get in the way of us embracing our first love and becoming like the church of Ephesus, of Ephesus and forgetting our first love. And so the question is, how, how are we vulnerable? And for the next few minutes, if you're new to church, if you're new to Eastern Hills, this might feel like a family conversation. Like if you've ever been to a family dinner before and people start talking about personal things, it's uncomfortable. Ooh, I picked enough night to be here. But at the same time, you learn some things. And for us today, as we pull back the curtain and we talk about some honest things, I hope that we all walk away saying, Ouch, that helps. Because we want to be the type of church that chooses discernment over judgment. And so the, the first thing for us as a church that I think would make us vulnerable to forgetting our first love is lack of vision. You know, in, in Proverbs it says that when the people don't have vision, what happens to them? They perish. And so one of my responsibilities as a pastor of this church is to cast vision is to say, hey, this is where we've been, and this is where we're going. 
And a couple years ago, we started that process. We started talking about the mission of our church. And since that time, there's been some distractions. And at times, it's felt like if you were a part of this church, maybe you've walked away saying, where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish? And I own that. That's on me as a leader. And at the same time, I will tell you that I'm very excited about where our church is going. And that there's been a lot of work behind the scenes and putting together vision and values. Our elder board is united and excited about what's to come. We're having conversations amongst our staff. And the next step is to bring in leaders through town halls and volunteers to get feedback so that we own this together. So that we're a church that doesn't lack vision, but that we're unified in what's next for our church. And there's a vision series that's coming in January, and we're going to talk more about this. But that doesn't mean that we don't stop, start, that we stop serving God in the meantime. We've got great things happening here at this church. In November, in the lobby, today after church, you're going to hear about something called Family Talks. So we asked you guys to fill out a card last week. It had community on it. I fumbled the ball in this service, did a lot better job second service. But some of you still filled out that card. And the overwhelming majority of our church said, we need community with other brothers sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so our first response is let's put something together in November, in November for a couple of weeks to get people into community. And you can find out more about that in the lobby today after service. We've got men's group that is still looking to launch this week. And so if you're not a part of community, that's an easy next step. But also in December, we will intentionally launch something called Connect Now. And some of you were a part of these gatherings last year. And the shift is the purpose of these gatherings is not just to get together to hang out, but to drive people into meaningful relationships and community. So great things are coming. But here's another way in which we might be vulnerable. Grumbling. See, there's a difference between lamenting and grumbling. We read about lamenting in the the last book of, or one of the the prophetic books, uh, the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk says, this is wrong, this is broken. How long must these things go on? And he laments. But what that does is it drives him towards God. And he says, God is sovereign. He's over all things. I'm not surprised by this. And it leads to contentment. In Jesus. That's lamenting. Grumbling says, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, I want things to be different, and it drives us towards discontentment and a lack of love for the Lord. And so we want to be the type of church that when we experience grumbling, we say, I'm not going to stand with you in that. Because this violates God's love for you, for me, and his church. And instead, I want to be grateful for all the great things that are happening here at our church. Let me give you an easy example of the type of things that happen that are not even programmed because of the ministry here at Eastern Hills. This past summer, we had vacation Bible school. A lot of families participated. One night, we were hanging out in the back patio. Um, Alex and Austin, some of the guys, are going through their playlist, and they're trying to decide what music should we play for the, for the, the part at the end where we're bringing all the students together. And I threw out a song that's like probably a decade old. So what about the church clap? And so they're like, yeah, we're going to do the church clap tonight. And for the rest of the week, we had all of these kids doing this dance called the church clap. And they loved it. Now let's fast forward a couple of months later. One of my daughters is hanging out with some of the gals that came, that she's in our neighborhood. And she pulls up her playlist. And do you know what the first song on the playlist was? Church clap. She's still walking around with the bracelet that we gave at VBS. This is a family that wouldn't say they're all in on Jesus. But that's how God works. That's how God moves. We can program things, but God's going to say, yep, that's great. I'm still going to do what I need to do because I'm God. And I love people and I love you. So here's the last thing that I think we're vulnerable to. Legacy apart from mission. I'm grateful that we're the the church that has 50 plus years of legacy where we can look back in the rear view mirror and say, look at all of the great things that God has done in our church. 
But when we do that, apart from mission, we forget that he's not done yet. And that there's a whole plethora of opportunities ahead of us as a church. When you drive on the road, do you drive like this? I hope not. I don't want to be on the road with you. You look at the rearview mirror occasionally, but your focus is on the road ahead of you. It's legacy and mission. Yes, God's done great things, but he's not done yet. We're helping people become fully engaged in Christ, at church, and on mission. And all of these homes are filled with people that are far from God. And we get to be a part of that. So this morning, we're going to respond with a, with, a, with a moment of prayer. And I want you to stand to your feet. And this comes out of the catechism that we've been in the past few weeks. It's a question and answer tool to help us think about important things. And the question this week is, what's the Lord's Prayer? And it comes from the Gospel of Matthew. We're not going to end in a song this morning. We're just going to end in prayer because the time's running late. But that's okay. Jesus shows up. Thanks, Stephen. Jesus shows up and not only models prayer, but he says, this is how we should pray. And do you know for thousands of years, churches have prayed this prayer? Some churches do this every single week. Austin comes from a church, they would do communion and they would say the Lord's Prayer. Because there's a whole lot that happens here in the Lord's Prayer. One of them being that it's not about what we want, it's about what God wants. And so here's my invitation. I want you to hold hands with someone this morning in the name of love. Do it. I can see the looks on your faces right now. There's hand sanitizer in the lobby. I know you don't like germs. I don't like germs. I'm not a hugger, but I get it. Sometimes in church we do hard things for the gospel. But we're doing this to stand unified and saying, we want to be the type of church that doesn't forsake our first love. We want to remember Jesus. And so Jesus said, this is how we do it. Let's pray it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we lift that prayer up to you. Help us in that way. Help us to be the type of church that's known for our love for you and your people. Help us to embrace discernment over judgment. Help us to lead by looking in the rearview mirror, but not forgetting about what's ahead of our church, God. I pray for unity. I pray for a clarity of purpose in what's ahead, that we would glorify you in all that we say or do. We pray these things in the power of your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Church, as you leave here this morning, know that you are sent. There's some great next steps in the lobby. We'll see you back next week. Have a great Sunday. Thanks again for joining us today. We are so glad you're a part of our worship. For those of you joining us today, we want to know the best way that we can serve you. And so the best way to do that is through the Connect card on our website. Just visit easternhills.org and under the Next Steps tab, fill it out and someone will follow up with you this week. We hope to see you back here next Sunday. Until then, we're praying that you have a great week.